Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event today. Super excited to dive right in. But before we get started, I'll wait a couple more minutes as more folks trickle in. I usually like to start off our events with a quick icebreaker. Um, and one icebreaker that I like to ask, especially as the warmer months are coming up here in Canada, especially, um, what is everyone's big travel plans for coming up this uh, the summer? And I'm going to pass it off to Sarah. Uh, do you have any big you know, summer plans coming up? Any trips? Um, well, Adam and I are going to President's Club. So we'll be in Mexico uh, next month, which is pretty exciting. And then um, I don't have any plans from there because I did so much traveling at the front half of the year that I just like, was like, I actually just need to, I need to stop and settle into my new house and maybe like unpack some boxes. So um, Mexico and that's it. That's what I've got going on. I'll popcorn over to Bridget. What are you going to do? Well, so I'm going to France for five days in two weeks. So that'd be fun. But at the back end of summer, I'm going on a uh, backpacking trip to Nepal. So I'm going to do about two weeks, three weeks in Nepal. Oh, wow. Are you going to get um, you going to get someone to like, oh, what's the word? A Sherpa to help you carry your stuff up the mountains? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I'm trying to convince my partner that's a necessary expense. So um, <laughs> let's keep fingers crossed. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how about you, Adam? Yeah, good question. Um, as a American that moved to Europe, I've learned that vacationing and holidays are taken a bit more seriously. So I'm taking advantage of that. Um, heading to Mexico, as Sarah mentioned, for President's Club, and then actually going to Budapest for the first time at the end of July to see the, uh, the Formula One Grand Prix, and then straight from there backpacking uh, in Mont Blanc. So the Tour de Mont Blanc, which starts in France, goes around to Italy and Switzerland for about 10 days. So I've got plenty, plenty planned. So I got a lot of work to do oh, between now and then. Nice. <laughs> nice. So Katie, what's your plan? What are you going to do? Wow, I've just gotten back from Mexico. So if you're in the same areas, <laughs> may let me know if you need any recommendations. Yes, um, send, them, send them to Adam and I. <laughs> I will do, I will do. Um, but now I'm going to be going to Greece. So doing a little bit of Greek island hopping, which I haven't done before. So I'm very excited about that. That sounds fantastic. We literally, I just packed my mom off to Greece yesterday. She came oh, and visited nice. me in New York and um, now she's taking a cruise. So it's pretty oh. exciting. It's my mom's second time in Europe ever. I'm very excited for her. I told oh, her to nice. share her vacation with me so I can like enviously track track her whereabouts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your, your mom could give me the Greek recommendations and I can give you the Mexican ones. Perfect. That sounds like great quid pro quo. <laughs> Well, thank you all for sharing your travel plans. I'm super jealous and I kind of want to book a trip to Mexico soon, uh, but we can get started. Uh, super excited to host today's event across the pond, how early stage startups sink or swim in a competitive market. But before we get started, I'm going to do some quick notes about MSP. Uh, so today's event is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros and Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement. Our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer questions through struggle on, to solve on their own and to help see around corners they might not know about. We do that through live sessions like the one you're at today, online forum, and our quarterly summits and our in-person events, which is coming back. So if you're not ready, a part of MSP, you'll be enjoyed to, you've been invited to join after this event. And then I'm gonna pass it off to Sarah to do a quick uh, intro on our sponsor today. Yeah, so Sales Impact Academy is the sponsor. Katie, Bridget, and I um, are all instructors over there. But basically what Sales Impact Academy is, it, it is the, uh, uh, master's degree in sales that you never got. Um, and so you have access to tons of fantastic instructors who take you from everything from intro to outbound prospecting, which I teach all the way up to how to execute as a uh, seed funded or series A CRO. So um, if there's something you want to learn about when it comes to being a master of sales, Sales Impact Academy has a course for you, but you guys should go check it out. Also, fun fact, if you are excited by this conversation, we have a 30-day free trial. So whether or not you are a beginner SDR and you are two months into seat or you're a 15-year or tenured CRO, um, there's probably a course for you and you can go check them out for a 30-day free trial. Pretty sweet. Thank you, Sarah. I'm actually going to drop that link right here in the chat, which we really encourage everyone to participate and engage in the chat. 
Um, some quick housekeeping notes. We do have a Q&A panel on the right-hand side. We also have a poll coming up and this event is gonna be recorded. So if you have colleagues that couldn't make it, we're gonna have the recording for them. So um, be sure to look out for that after the event. Awesome. And now I think we are going to jump over to introductions. Is that right, Angelica? Correct. Okay, cool. Well, um, I've got an amazing panel with me. I will be hosting because I don't know anything about selling into Europe or vice versa. <laughs> um, I am just a lowly account executive who happens to get to have a lot of conversations with CROs and VPs of sales. But the people I'm with, um, they have experienced penetrating new markets. Um, so really quickly, we've got Katie Miles on the line, and she's actually one of Outreach's first sales hires in Europe um, after the company's initial launch, launch in the United States. She has worked as both an SDR and account executive um, since selling into the European market. Katie helped to bring over the mechanisms that work in the U.S. while also pivoting to adapt the company's strategy towards the European market and managing different sales processes depending on the region in question. Um, also with us, we had Adam Ochar, a good friend of mine. He was actually one of the first SDR hires over at Gong back in 2018 and was also a landing account executive for Gong in Europe. Um, since the inception of Gong's EMEA team in February 2021, Adam has helped the team grow to over 40 employees. Having only been to Europe once, Adam has had to quickly learn about the nuances of selling in Europe. Um, over a year later, he now is focused on repeating success and helping the broader team quickly get up to speed. And then finally, we have the wonderful Bridget Fox. Bridget has spent the last 11 years working in enterprise sales as both a leader and individual contributor. She was employee number 10 in EMEA for two hypergrowth scale-ups, MuleSoft and Databricks. If you haven't heard of those, I don't think you've ever dabbled in SaaS. So huge deal. <laughs> um, she led the international expansion into new territories such as the UK, France, Southern EMEA, and the Middle East. She has extensive experience of selling to diverse non-US audiences, of growing and leading teams in new markets and adapting sales processes and marketing strategy to find go-to market fit new territories. Um, she's currently the acting chief revenue officer of a seed stage AI startup, a Ferris, and runs her own consultancy business, coaching founders of seeds and Siri A startups on the revenue and growth strategies. So that is our panel for today. We've got practitioners and masterminds behind the strategy of selling um, across diverse uh, territories and accounts. Um, so let's get into it because I'm sure you're all really, really excited to get into this conversation and not hear about who we are, but actually talk about the content. Um, as we jump into the first question, which is actually for Bridget, I would love to hear in the poll, who do we have on the line? Is this, do we have sales leaders? Do we have individual contributors, AEs, SDRs? Let us know. And then feel free to mention in the chat where you're calling in from. All right, do we have a lot of Europeans? Do we have people from the States and Canada? Or like, where is everyone from? Let's hear it. Um, cool. So, so Bridget, before we, we jump actually into the nitty gritty of leading international sales orgs, um, I'd love it if you could set the stage for us. Um, the reality is that many startups never make it to the phase where they have successful international expansions because less than half a percent of startups make it past Series A. So my first question for you is, in your experience, why do you think that is? Why don't companies make it past Series A? Yeah, a great question. So I think, um, you know, having worked in companies that have made it past Series A and really scaled out to, to that kind of public offering, but also now being so focused on companies that are really at that early stage, that seed and Series A, there are some there's some interesting things that happen at that stage, right? So at the seed stage, investors have really primarily invested in an idea, right? There's an idea, there maybe is no product yet, there might just be a pitch deck, there's definitely no sales and marketing normally. Um, really, the goal is just to prove that there's a market with that seed money. So there's tons of things that can happen there. You can run out of time, you can run out of money, you can maybe disprove that there's even a requirement for your product. Tons of things that happen at seed. Um, I think it's about 80 to 90 percent of startups actually don't make it even out of seed before you get to that, you know, 0.5 percent that don't make it to Series A. But I think for this conversation, maybe what's the most interesting in terms of why startups don't make it is, if those businesses do make it from a seed to series A, they get this huge cash injection, right? They get this huge cash injection into the business wow. um, that is really all about moving from 
product market fit to go to market fit, right? Go to market fit is classically what companies have to go and do at Series A. And I think the mentality of, of founders and the executive teams and these kinds of businesses are kind of, let's hire tons of salespeople, let's hire some marketing, let's just go sell this thing, right? Let's just go sell it. And I think this is really where things can go awry. Um, I see kind of two key challenges in this, right? The first is, you can hire too many salespeople <clears throat> and you can build a revenue function way too soon before you've actually built the foundations that you need to be successful and to get hold of that market. That's kind of the first thing. And the second thing is scaling too soon, right? So not just hiring too many people, but doing too many things, going into too many markets at once, trying too many industries at once, maybe even trying to sell multiple products across multiple geographies. And I think a lot of the reasons why startups really fail in that stage is they fail to properly prepare, plan, and execute their go-to-market strategy and find that go-to-market fit. Adam and Katie, I know that you both sell to sales leaders who are trying to figure out these things, and it's easier said than done. What, what are some of the things that you hear repeatedly throughout the discovery calls that you're having as you're helping sales leaders figure out what their strategy will be um, as they're expanding and, and figuring out their go-to-market strategy? So, uh Bridget, I love what you said there about preparing, planning, executing, and, and basically being able to do that. And I think especially when you're working with those very, very early stage startups, the, the seed round ones, while it, you know, you might have like the founder of the company that often will start out selling, they've probably built the product as well. Maybe they came up with their idea, they're super passionate about it. But it's when they start having problems with being able to basically scale that knowledge and scale that passion as they start to make hires inside of the sales team. So when you're really early on, being able to basically replicate their knowledge and replicate what they know's work and, and being able to get that across the whole sales org. Yeah, and I think we're spotting a trend, right? It's so focused on the people. Um, mm -hmm. In my roughly four years at Gong, I've primarily focused on like the SMB, so sub 250 employees. So typically from C to series B, series sometimes series C. The biggest thing specifically today is at that point in your business, it's so important that you hire just all around, or the term all around athletes, right? I heard that on a podcast recently and it really stuck out to me. You can't hire people that want to come and sell. You have to hire people that want to sell and want to build and mm -hmm. really want to contribute and be a part of the team. And I think that at that early stage, you're going to wear way more hats than just your normal role. And that's just the nature of it. So I don't know how to identify that, but I know it's something I hear across the board and it's really what I, what's uh, splits people that succeed early. So Bridget, some of the things that I'm hearing is um, you need to have uh, the right people, people who don't just know how to sell, but also want to build. Mm -hmm. um, I heard from you something that sounded to me like repeatable selling process. You mm -hmm. have to have a certain amount of wins wherever you're currently selling with whatever you're selling. Um, yeah. And you don't want to go too fast and do too many things at once. So w when you're advising these like series, series A startups and they're trying to decide when to expand, like, what are the telltale signs before you can go, okay, cool, I'm ready to penetrate a new account or, or a new territory. I'm ready to, to move into Europe or I'm ready to move into North America. Yeah, actually, I think there's a couple of ways of thinking about that, that question. So one is um, for a startup, right, they are trying to just enter a market, right, normally, right? They're trying to, start to try to get into their first market, right, before they start thinking about expansion and going into new markets. And this might be an unpopular thing to say on a, on a sales webinar, but actually there's an order of operations that really has to be thought about and in place before you even hire salespeople, right, before you establish a sales process. So silver bullets are kind of what people expect from salespeople. They think salespeople are the magic wand for growth. They are not. You need to have a solid messaging framework, right? Who do you deliver value to? What kind of problems do they have? How do you uniquely solve them? That is the domain of product and marketing, right? Product market fit, step step one, that needs to be established. Have your messaging framework and have a playbook that you can hand to your salespeople so they can rinse repeat, right? Before you start to hire. I think that the second thing as well in that question is how do you know you're ready to expand beyond that, right? Well, the indicators are, again, going back to go to market fit, can you repeatedly run that play? Can you use that messaging? Can you use your target personas? Can you use your ideal customer profiles that you've built out with marketing and product? Can you prove them with sales in one single focus market before you think about how you might need to adapt that to a future market? And the indicators clearly there are usually revenue, right? And net retention, but they're also maybe around you know NPS, satisfaction. 
ultimately would the customer be screaming if you took that product away right it's a slightly less uh, lagging indicator so there's the make sure you know what you're doing in your first market and then try to apply the same principles to your new markets with the, the right level of adaption do you have a rule of thumb for success because you know i think about it's not the same but i'm thinking about it it's like promotion path from sdr to account executive just because you've hit quota for six months as an sdr doesn't mean that you're going to be a successful ae just because you've like mm -hmm. had a repeatable playbook for six months does that mean okay we're ready we're ready for the big times let's move like yeah. what do you tell people is there a time limit is there anything like that to keep in mind no it's going to depend on the business right so i work with some businesses who have 12 month sales cycles right and they're seed stage businesses 12 month sales cycles they have three customers but that is product market fit because of the type of business and technology they sell i work with other businesses who are bringing on you know x amount of like monthly recurring revenue in addition to what they already had as a base every month consistently right and i think the key thing is consistency can you consistently build pipeline with your target profiles can you consistently move that pipeline through your sales process however long that is can you consistently close it and then can you retain it right and yeah. so that is really the i guess the, the the keys to success is the the consistency rather than the timeline so we've got a, a huge amount of individual contributors on the line right now. And so I, I kind of want to pivot to Adam and Katie, who are boots on the ground, right? You are basically sitting opposite of Bridget. She's got this strategy in place, and now you have to go act on it. And, and one of the first things you, you mentioned was um, having a solid messaging framework. Katie, when, when we were actually prepping for this, you had talked about how um, when you were launching um, the European branch for outreach, um, there was like messaging frameworks that you had in place when you're trying to penetrate these new accounts. And so I I'm curious, um, what stayed the same and what, what changes, um, uh, did you have to make as you were figuring out what will resonate for European companies? Mm, yeah, for sure. So, um, like you said that outreach is an American company and I was one of the first hires in the UK. So while we could absolutely bring their messaging over, we just quickly realized and found out that what was working in the North American market wasn't working the same in the European market. So one of uh, the kind of biggest changes was using towards messaging versus using away messaging. So in America, the messaging that was often successful with people was using that um, towards messaging. So people buying into basically the benefits that your product or your service could give them. So for example, um, we're helping other people to grow, to have more revenue, to have more pipeline. Whereas in Europe, um, that just, it, it wasn't kind of getting people in. So we were using away messaging of the problems that we're basically solving for people instead. So we're gonna stop you from not having enough pipeline to reach your target, not being able to ramp your hires, not being able to grow or whatever it may be, depending on who it is you're selling to. but basically being able to pivot that and, and flip it around. Um, and another question for you, but if you kind of expand that to our larger audience right now, what kind of changes should businesses be then thinking about when they launch into EMEA versus selling into the United States? Mm -hmm. So I think selling into the US, it's, it's more of a pool sell. So it's, okay, I'm going out there and buying something and I'm gonna go and choose between my options. and often I'm going to be able to choose very quickly between which option I want to go for. Whereas in Europe, it seems to be a lot more of a kind of push sell. So when you launch over here, I imagine that's quite a different thing to get on board with. And Europeans are much more careful buyers, it seems. Um, maybe they, they don't like to part with their money. They're not as keen to be able to make a risk. So basically being able to build that relationship with people probably going to be a longer sales cycle it's probably going to be more complicated as well things like securities um huge when you're selling into some european countries and being able to basically manage that that push sell um of okay i need to go out there i need to go and find buyers and i need to drive the sale more adam I, I, i'm going a little bit off script from the from the questions that i had arranged but i mean you are an american seller who had to make this transition to selling into european markets you're waking up at what three in the morning on the west coast <laughs> to have your calls and i'm curious like for you what were the big 
either behavioral changes or mindset changes or or have you had a totally different experience than what Katie's describing? Yeah, I think it's a good question. To your first point, tactically, I wouldn't recommend anyone selling to Europe from San Francisco. I did it for nine months <laughs> and uh, it, it was a yeah, it wasn't fun. But look, I think there's some obvious things that you have to actually live through them to really get an understanding. And one of the biggest things I heard going into this is a very simple fact that there's not a European culture, right? We're, we're talking about 50 ish countries, right? There's so much nuance involved. And there were days where I'd have four negotiation calls and it was one with someone in Tel Aviv, one in Amsterdam, one in Dublin, and one in London. And like the structure of those calls, right? It's, it's everything's going to be completely different. Um, so that was one thing that I had to learn. I think what's what's awesome from my perspective going as an American that really had the expertise and domain knowledge around Gong, then going to Europe, was I had the ability to then learn the nuance from the people that are in Europe. Meanwhile, they're asking me for the nuance and how to sell Gong. So really leaning to my teammates was helpful. Um, but yeah, I would say that's probably the, the biggest thing was just getting an understanding of within each of these regions, how do we sell, what does the playbook look like, and so on. Practically, um, for the people on the line who are individual contributors who might be doing one of these hops and figuring out what their playbook is, like what, what practical advice can you give them? Whether it's like, if you're selling in Germany, make sure that you start your security review on day one <laughs> or like, what is it? Is there anything that we can tactically take away from your learnings? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in and say like, number one, you have to almost get rid of ego and treat yourself like a new onboarded hire, right? So like, take everything you know as framework, but be really, really agile. Like I'm still today, uh, it's, it's February, 2021. So over a year I've been selling in EMEA and I'm still sitting down with my manager saying, we got to change the playbook in this market. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing, the term that really stuck out to me is invisible walls. Like in Europe, I feel like you run into these invisible walls all the time. And if you're in like the German market, again, it's works councils or it's selling through security, right? Um, there's just, like uh, Katie mentioned, there's risk aversion to spending money at times within certain markets. So kind of asking yourself, like, what can't I see that can get in the way? And then using that to call your deals and forecast and, and be more strategic. Mm. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Um, I like what you said there about changing up the playbook constantly. Like there isn't just a, a copy and paste approach into every country in Europe. You have to be able to pivot quickly um, and just, as kind of a, a practical tip alongside that, I guess, is you're going to be using different channels and different touch points if you are outbound prospecting to people in different European countries. Um, I think in America, if you're calling into a country, it can be a brilliant way to book a meeting. Whereas if you're going to be prospecting into Europe, sometimes you have to get a little bit more creative with that. For example, um, I know that the types of data you can buy for some European countries, such as like Germany, for example, you're going to have maybe problems with finding like direct numbers. So how can you make people videos on LinkedIn or just get a little bit more creative with the ways that you're actually selling? So, yeah, my practical tip would be to explore different channels um, for getting through to people. And I'd love to just bounce off that. So <clears throat> both been an SDR in my early days, but also managing SDR teams, I would say there are just cultures where it is really very rude to cold call or yeah. it's really very rude to um, go to multiple people in an account and go above them into their boss, right? So there, mm -hmm. are, there are many kind of, I think Adam used invisible walls. I love that term because there are invisible hierarchies. There are different ways of kind of how kind of organizations are structured, different rules when it comes to work. And I think, you know, I'm going to give some credit to the Germans because I work for a German startup right now, right? There's a very security focus, but they're actually pretty flat in terms of their structure. You go somewhere like France and it's super hierarchical. The Middle East, again, super hierarchical. And there are people mm -hmm. you will never speak to. So you know, methodologies like Medic, they tell you talk to economic buyers. Sometimes you will never speak to them because they are so senior and so high up in the business. So I think being able to adapt whatever is given to you to a particular market is really, really key. And anybody that says that everyone buys the same is absolutely lying or they've never had experience mm -hmm. with it because it's not true. I, I was actually gonna go to you next, Bridget, because I wanted to ask about what advice do you have for sales leaders who are walking into a completely new country with its own customs and culture? And there's so many times I've talked to a sales leader who's coming from France and is now living in San Francisco. Or the other day I got off the phone with an Irish guy who was in Brazil. Or today I talked to an American who is located in the UK. So what do those people need to keep in mind strategically, especially? 
Yeah, I mean, some of it has been covered beautifully by Adam. So I, I mean, just eventually keep a few key things there. But one thing I do want to say is I, I've lived, I've lived this, right? So I set up the French office for both meals and books. You know, I, I'm fluent in French. I have lived in France. Um, I had never worked in France before. Even with that cultural knowledge, I could not crack France, right? I really had to hire a team of local people who knew the network, who knew the people in their industries who could have lunch at the side of the Seine River and schmooze the right people because it was that kind of culture. And so, you know, the learnings that I took away from that really are however good you are in sales or however good you are as a leader in your own context, be super humble walking into a new one. In fact, maybe don't even walk into it at all. Hire someone to walk into it for you who really can, you know, kind of deliver that. Now, it's going to depend on your business. It's going to depend on whether or not you're doing everything remotely, etc. But you know, I really do believe that you should be leaning on people who are local. You can do this by partners if you have partners that have local networks that you can kind of tap into and just get a sense of the market. Um, you can do this via maybe just your own personal networks and people that have done this before. But, you know, certain markets in particular, they're going to really require boots on the ground. Um, I think the other thing is, is that you can't over index enough on data, right? So really understanding the data for that market, like understand really does your target buyer exist are there additional competitive solutions too because you do find in europe that the competitive landscape is really fragmented across a lot of different industries and competitors that maybe the marketing team in san francisco um are talking about are not the ones you have to worry about in israel right or dubai so i think understand your data does your target buyer exist there are there enough target buyers and enough companies with the right profile to actually build a sustainable business and also, what's your opportunity to go via a partner? Because if you can do indirect sales, actually, it's a much faster route to market. It can be a lot cheaper. It can be a lot low risk, a lot lower risk, a lot easier to pull out of that market to test it too. So that was quite a lot of stuff. But, you know, I think on top of what Adam has said, on top of what Katie has said in terms of adapting things, those would be the key things I'd suggest to a leader. Yeah, what, what I'm hearing is... Um... Find the right data, trust your data, and trust your people, and trust your people to build the relationships that you need. Yeah. And I think uh, those those things are cyclical, right? You have to have a feedback loop between all of that in order to be working properly. And yeah. so I'd, I'd love to hear from all three of you, but um, having all been part of the founding teams that have gone into a new territory, how do you have a good working relationship between boots on the ground and sales leadership in order to have an effective go-to-market strategy? I see everyone um, nodding. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll jump in that. I'll jump in there first. Um, so I think that I mean having that feedback loop is so essential there. Um, if you're going to be, you know, opening up an office in a European country when your US headquarters, not just seeing that as like an isolated satellite office, um, and having those reps on the ground that are going out, maybe hearing the objections firsthand that you're coming up against making sure that, that they're getting listened to. Um, the copy and paste approach isn't gonna work and there's gonna be a whole lot of A-B testing of trial and error that's gonna go into this. So maybe you know your, your reps in the new office that you launch has a direct line to speak to the leaders in the business that are maybe higher up, maybe you build out content committees to be able to look at the type of messaging that's being worked, but yeah, having that direct loop between the people on the ground and the people that are leading the company is super important. Yeah, yeah, I think the feedback loop and also um, acting on the feedback loop. So some markets are just not mm. going to be successful. Some new ventures, some new territories are not going to be successful. But if you just kind of invest and let it run and don't act on the feedback or don't really take yeah. feedback seriously, you can end up in a territory for a long time, losing money and, and basically diluting focus, right? Because you could be doing other things with those resources and those people. So I think there has to be a mentality, especially when you're just testing things, of fail fast, like learn, fail fast and move on to other areas that might be better for you at that stage in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think all of this, I'm just like, replaying all the things I've learned since doing this and that aligns. I think one thing um, at Gong that we did really, really well was we hired someone that was potentially overqualified, right? GM level experience where you'd think it's like, let's throw a bunch of reps out there with a the manager and have them kind of learn. We hired someone that, you know, had GM level experience to be the VP and run the region. 
And then the person that we hired, Wendy, Wendy Harris was willing to get in the front lines and actually ran sales cycles early. Yeah. Right. So like, funny enough, I was giving her deal advice, right. In the midst of her having all this experience. So I think you have to hire someone that again, back to that all around athlete, it's not just the AEs, it's not just the SDRs, it's, it's leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second thing is I think you have to just create a ton of raving fans. You have to keep your early customers really, really close. References are absolute gold in Europe, way more than in the US, honestly. I was actually blown away by that. You need like a, you need a Rolodex of go-to um, customers that you can reference to kind of create that tribal, uh, tribal buying. Um, but yeah, no, it starts at the top with someone that's willing to get into the weeds. And then you have those close customers that you can go to and say, how are things? Let's iterate what should we change and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I kind of want to pivot in the in the time that we have left. We'll maybe chat for maybe 10, 10 more minutes or so, and then we'll we'll move to questions from the audience. But um, one thing that is is happening very recently is our macro economy is shifting. And um, what just a few months ago was a very sweet, awesome time to be selling. And um, it was a great time to be looking for a job and uh, things were going really smoothly. Now the economy is not looking so hot. So Bridget, I first wanted to start with you and, and just see if you could, could kind of just set the stage for us and kind of give us, tell, tell us what's happening, um, brief, brief the audience, and then, and then we can kind of talk about how things might shift and what people should keep in mind um, as they're selling in what I would call tough times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so I think there's, there's kind of what's happening with the, the startup investment VC kind of world and that's impacted by what's happening in the kind of wider economy, right? So anybody who's been watching the news will know that the valuations have just been wiped off the stock market and the tech markets in the past few months, right? That's trickling down really into the kind of early stage market. Um, if you've been in B2B SaaS for kind of the last 10 years or so, you'll probably be used to uh the very bubbly frothy world of vc where companies are getting massive cash injections on very little data um you know people talk anecdotally about series a now is kind of like well seed sorry is kind of like series a now in terms of the, just the sums of money that are, were being invested until recently what's happened in the last couple of weeks and i know this because i'm right in the middle of some <clears throat> investment cycles with some of the startups that i work with is the B market closed down, the A market's now closing down, and pretty much any company that was about to go out for a raise to get that injection for go-to-market fit is kind of looking at 12 to 18 months before they can viably get some money, right? What does that actually mean? That means that everybody's gonna have to knuckle down, they're gonna have to really double down on the fundamentals, they're gonna have to make businesses that have the potential to be profitable, which is absolutely not the way the startup world has, has functioned for the last 10 years, right? You're not really profitable until, even post going public. And so all of the things we were talking about around, um, you know, product market fit, go to market fit, order of operations, right? Having your messaging framework, having your ideal customer profile mapped out, and then being consistent across building pipe, building demand gen, closing demand gen, keeping your customers. It is more important than ever because otherwise the startup will die because it won't have any revenue. So that is the reality of what's happening in the market. But I think it just means that we will become more disciplined, right? We will have less cash to throw around. We'll have to do more with what we've got. And I actually do believe that that will breed a ton of opportunity for startups that are innovative, that are creative, and that are highly disciplined with the resources that they have. So just my perspective on that. Katie and Adam, you both work, work for startups that are considered to be those things. Um, they're both, you know, very well-known unicorns. And you both also happen to have the benefit of selling to sales leaders on a daily basis. Um, how has the macro economy changed those conversations? What trends are you, are you seeing on the front lines? Yeah, I think that there's there's no hiding that everyone's kind of tightening the purse strings a bit, right? And I think we're kind of in this unknown phase where in the US we saw GDP dip, I think it was like 1.4% last quarter of Europe. It was almost stagflation. Um, so this next quarter, I think is going to be really big. And I think until then, we need to be really, really efficient with our time and who we talk to. And I think you just need to have those discussions around, hey, has anything come from the top down around budget freezes or spending or maybe the way you're evaluating tools? Because to expect people to come forward and tell you that, it's not always going to happen. Um, I would say that that's probably consistent in all markets, not just in, in Europe or, or in the States. What I will say is that I'm learning here that people are a bit less risk averse right? In terms of just a lot mm -hmm. of things in the European market versus where in the States, it's like, it's kind of spend fast, hire fast, fire fast. It's just not the culture here. So building a good relationship, 
I don't think anyone's going to buy from anyone that they don't trust right now, especially. So I think a couple of things. So mm -hmm. having those hard conversations, building that, building that trust and just making sure you're on the same page. Yeah, I, I really like how you said there about basically tackling it head on and not waiting for it to come up later on in the sales process. But uh, I guess kind of before you do get to that point, um, if you're going to look at something quite niche within that, it would just be it's going to be more important than ever to basically create urgency when you are selling and when you are kind of running sales cycles. So maybe that's through um, through finding more pain from people. Um, but yeah, if people are going to be careful for spending, then you're going to need to make sure that it's urgent for them to fix the problems that you're solving. Um, so you can use that when these difficult conversations do come up. Awesome. Bridget, did you have anything to add? Because those are all the questions that I have for today. And so I'd, I'd love to open it up for Q&A um, unless anyone has anything else that they wanted to to tie a bowstring around this conversation. <laughs> I just said one thing, and it was on the back of what Katie said, which is about creating urgency and pain. I think if anyone's familiar with the Challenger sale, which has kind of been my Bible since Millsoft, um, the study that CEB did on those different seller types, right, Lone Wolf, et cetera, three to Challenger, the Challenger stood out as like the only profile of salesperson. It consistently reached or exceeded their targets, even through economic downturn. And the reason that they could do that is that they were teaching the customer about problems they didn't know they had, and they were selling to those problems rather than going head to head with their competitors. So that's a really mm -hmm. good one. If you guys haven't heard it or read it, um, definitely recommend just having a flick through. But there's some real stuff in there about how to sell in really difficult selling environments. So I love that yeah. one. I have been I have been thinking about the challenger sale lately and what am I going to need to hunker down, buckle down and do differently? And what, what are the things that I'm going to have to just do more of the same? Um, so uh, we do have one question. Um, and I think I, if I hit the share button, other people can see this. Oh, great. Yeah. So here's the question. Um, it's from David. So I run business de I've, I've run business development for a five-year startup where the platform we sell can work with many different departments and industries. With the options being endless and our GTM team agreeing to an ICP, what strategy would you recommend when IB leads come about that are well outside of the ICP? In other words, how do you manage the traffic of the go-to-market plan and the IB traffic? Anyone want to tackle this one? <laughs> I, can, I can take a first take and then the guys can come over the top. So, um, so this happened a ton at MuleSoft. We had loads of inbound leads. We had a real inbound model. Lots of people could download community version. And some of it was total. It was just, there was a non-starter, right? Um, what really shifted was we started to just qualify out. Like the, the mentality of the SDRs was actually about qualifying out. And it feels unnatural when you're a salesperson because you want to qualify in and you want that deal and you want to believe that it's something you can you can sell to. But if it doesn't fit in your ICP, there's probably a reason why, right? There's a probably a reason why your ICP has been developed and all of your go-to-market efforts, I would imagine, are focused on not just attracting those buyers, but actually selling to them and then delivering the solution to them, right? So your whole post-sales process as well is probably set up to, to your ICPs. So I think you have to, to look at this in, in, in kind of two ways. One is can we quite like does it make sense to qualify this out like can we qualify it out if not can we actually even service it if i sell to it the second thing is is what do you lose like really if it's not qualified right you don't lose anything by um qualifying that thing out early on the flip side you can lose a ton of time if actually you take that thing through the sales cycle and you can't service it so i would just say make sure that you understand why the icp is the icp Make sure that you understand, you know, what you're taking on if you do decide to take it into your pipeline, but usually qualify that thing out. Mm. It's kind of like what Adam um, just said there with like, you've got to be selfish and efficient with your time and with who you're actually speaking to. And exactly to echo that, Bridget, if you've got a lead that you're literally not going to be able to service, then there's no point taking it past that first email or that first phone call that you have with them. Yeah, and I think adding on to all that, um, you have to be very, very just blunt with what your ICP is and explain the vision of your product to these individuals, right? So they get an understanding of, hey, there may be some overlap, but what we're trying to solve just isn't aligned with what you're trying to solve today. And they might come back to you and say, actually, you've misinterpreted and they might actually be more ICP than you thought, but you'll never know if they don't truly know what your vision is as an organization, as a company. So um, I think that's really important. And then going back to Bridget, I was 
you know, a, a green SDR three years and eight months ago. And it took me a very long time to disqualify like the first person and DQ someone through like just discovering and finding out they're not ICP and the same when I became an account executive, but it's insanely liberating. And the reality is if you need to dip into the pool outside of ICP, there's probably bigger business problems. You need to funnel it up to the top, right? Mm -hmm. You should have enough TAM within your ICP that you don't stress about these. Yeah. One thing I, I will say that I've seen Gong try is that we've established tiger teams. Uh, and we've basically said, hey, thematically, we're seeing maybe there could be a fit in this, you know, in this one specific industry or this one group. So why don't we just dedicate a small team to going in and digging into it and seeing if there's anything worth pursuing? And then if it is, then we then we can op open up our ICP to include them. But that way, if you have like a dedicated resource that is specifically looking at these fringe cases and figuring out if there's a fit or not, you're not wasting a bunch of account executives times, SDRs times, exploring these when they could just be working their proper book and, and making themselves money and making money for the business. We've got, uh, we've got another question from Josh. Uh, he says, does downward pressure on the economy change the split between focusing on net new and existing business sales for account-based businesses? Um, I, I think I could jump in here. I, I've been studying a ton and whether it's reading a blog or listening to podcasts, um, I'm obviously not involved with like the high level uh, discussions internally at Gong around fundraising and longevity, but there is a larger focus right now on cash flow and burn rate. So I think that um, I don't know if you peel back focus on net new, but I think if you're on the CS side and you're thinking about upsell and renewals, it's really an important time to make sure that NPS is in a good place and all those leading indicators um, are in a healthy place. That being said, I think on the new, the net new side of business, there does need to be a shift in messaging to align with the way things are, right? And funny enough, I mean, we're kind of coming off another shift in messaging we had around COVID where everyone had to adapt and kind of start over. Um, our CRO just gave a speech talking about efficiency is like the number one thing people care about. Can we do more or the same with less, right? So I think that you change focuses within both, the, both those business units, but yeah, you need to adapt. Yeah, I would also say that uh, someone mentioned it earlier that in times of crisis, people buy from people they trust. They tend to double down on the solutions that they have rather than going out to market to buy new ones and entering those processes. I definitely saw this in the startup I worked with um, when the COVID pandemic hit, right? A lot of people doubled down on the things that they were already bought from us. But equally, we lost a lot of pipeline to companies that had competitive alternatives that they already worked with and they just decided to double down on too. So I think maybe not necessarily stopping with a new business, but really think about how you can can leverage the situation as well with your existing customers to secure secure the revenue. I have a I have a follow up question to that. But do you think that uh, tech companies are going to be like sort of diversifying their portfolio, especially during this this time to, to see how much they can have attach rates and expand their their current um, customer base? Or do you so, think people will just keep doubling down? It's a question for just the general audience. It just popped into my brain, <laughs> or the or, or the general panel. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that similarly to normal times, I think you need to be laser focused and not dilute what you're going after, especially if you're new and you're going into new markets, right? For those early stage companies, I think trying to boil the ocean right now and selling half baked products, it's just not going to survive. I think you have mm -hmm. to have something that's fully aligned and, and solve one niche thing before you half solve 10 things. I can only agree. Yeah, fully agree. Me too. Yeah. Great. All minds think alike here. <laughs> Great minds. <think> <laughs> Um, so I think that's it for questions from the audience that I've seen in the Q&A. If anybody else has anything they want to throw in the in the chat or in the Q&A, um, please do. But otherwise, I think we have exhausted um, our, our list of questions and conversation. So thank you, Katie, Adam, and Bridget. I really appreciate your time. I think Angelica will be popping back on in just a minute um, for some closing remarks. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. I really, really appreciate everyone's time. And thanks for tuning in. And thanks for everybody who's watching the recording. Thank you so much. And before we wrap things up, I want to say thank you again for everyone attending. Um, and thank you, Sales Impact Academy, for today's event. Through this partnership, Sales Impact Academy is providing MSP community members free access to the Academy for a full 30 days, starting now. And I'm actually going to paste the 
registration link in the chat again right here. So please, please uh, check that link and you can get access to this amazing offer and also access to these amazing speakers like we had today. And on that note, I want to say a special thank you to um, Katie, Bridget, and Adam for an amazing informative session and Sarah for moderating. The recording and key takeaways will be available on the MSP website shortly. And don't forget to check out our upcoming events and we hope to see you there. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, guys. Thank See you later. Thanks, everyone.